so glad this little one's here. Well, I'd love for you to open your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And if you don't have a Bible with you here this morning, we'd love to put one in your hands. We'd love for you to be able to follow along. So just raise your hand, and these kind gentlemen will make sure you get a copy of God's Word so that you can follow along with us this morning. I have been to the mall. I'm not recommending such an enterprise. I wouldn't suggest that you go there. But uh, I'm so glad they have those maps. They're hard to find, but you know those maps that show you the layout of the mall, and they have the little red arrow that says, you are here with a dot. And the reason I love those signs is because I believe the mall is something of a trap. They, they want you to get in, and they don't want you to get out. Uh, they arrange the furniture so that you don't know where the exit doors are. I need that map. I need to know where I am so that I can leave. I think it's important to know your place wherever you are. And this morning, we're going to get a chance to catch a glimpse again of where we are in the timeline of God's world. You and I need the you are here arrow to remind us where we stand, where we walk, where we get up in the morning and eat our breakfast and put on our clothes and go about our business. Very generally speaking, we are post-Eden, pre-heaven. You are here in between Genesis 3 and Revelation chapter 20. You and I exist in a broken, cursed, fallen world. Things are not yet as they are supposed to be, and things are not as they originally were. We are in this in-between time, and I believe we need a map. We need a map for knowing how to navigate life in a broken and cursed world. The next section we're going to be looking at in Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verse 1, really all the way through the middle of chapter 11, is a series of Proverbs proverbial statements of wisdom. These are wisdom statements delivered in the form of Proverbs, short statements of keen observations on life. Proverbs are maxims that hold general truth for situations in life, truisms. You have to understand that proverbial literature, proverbial statements are not the same as universal promises. They're not even unconditional truths. They are rather general principles, principles whose outcomes have exceptions, right? Just ask Job, who lived his, wife and lived his life in a God-fearing way, full of wisdom. And yet his life did not bear out the outcomes of the things that wisdom holds forth. The reason for that is precisely because we live... In a fallen world. We are a fallen humanity living in a God-cursed world. And so things don't always work out as they should, as they ought. Solomon wrote many Proverbs. Some of them are contained in the book of Proverbs in your Bibles. Some of them are contained here in this middle section of Ecclesiastes. And I don't think it's surprising that we should stumble across some of Solomon's Proverbs in the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon has set up the problem of life in the beginning of Ecclesiastes, and he's driving us to the solution to the problem of life at the end of Ecclesiastes. And here in this middle section, he's going to give us wisdom for how to navigate life right where we are. Living under the sun, but casting our gaze over the sun in faith towards God, the one who will rectify every wrong, but not yet. And we need to talk a little bit about Old Testament wisdom and its place in the life of a New Testament believer. What is the relationship for the Proverbs to our lives today? I mean, Solomon wrote these some 3,000 years ago. Are these to be applied to us? Do these regulate our lives? This is a little bit different than asking the question, am I under Old Testament law? You know that God gave the law to Israel through Moses to regulate the theocracy under God's king in the land of Israel for very specific purposes. Israel's task under Mosaic law was to stay 
and obey, and so that a watching world would see that their God, Yahweh, the God overall, is unique, and that they as his people are unique. That was their commission. That's different than ours. Ours, as disciples of Jesus Christ, Matthew 28, is to go and proclaim. And so the rules that Israel lived under are different than the rules you and I live under in the New Testament. By the way, I, I love a good BLT CSP sandwich, right? Bacon, lettuce, tomato, cucumber, can't forget the cucumber, and salt and pepper. You couldn't do that under Mosaic law. We as New Testament believers, not under Mosaic law, are free to eat BLT CSPs. <laughs> but what about Old Testament Proverbs? Are we somehow under them? Do they relate to us? What is the relationship? And, and we're going to have now seven chapters to discuss the relationship of Old Testament Proverbs to the life of a New Testament believer. I just want to start off this conversation uh, helping us think through a couple of things. Many of the Proverbs we'll look at are specific to Solomon's day and Solomon's context. They will be specific wisdom statements given for how to operate, how to live in a God-cursed, fallen world in Israel in Solomon's day under the theocracy while under Mosaic law. Some of the wisdom statements will be very applicable to Solomon's day and not quite as directly applicable to us. But I think what we're going to find this morning by way of example is many of these Old Testament wisdom statements while stated very generally in Proverbs and in the Proverbs of Ecclesiastes, we will see that the New Testament puts very specific commands onto these proverbial principles. We might see something generally stated in Ecclesiastes as a proverb that then gets very specific as a command or a principle for us New Testament believers. So we'll walk through some of those this morning. We'll see a lot of those as we go through. Let's back up and just think about where we are in the book of Ecclesiastes. What is our context? What have we learned so far? We've learned that life under the sun is a futility, that, that word hevel, that wonderful Hebrew word you all learned. It is an emptiness, a vanity, a, a nothing. It's like trying to get the steam off the top of a cup of coffee, and, and the minute you grab it, it's gone. It's like a striving after the wind. And trying to find life or meaning or ultimate satisfaction under the sun will always leave you wanting. It will always leave you disappointed. You will agree with the 20th century poet who said, I can't get no satisfaction. Solomon experimented with all of that under the sun and found it all wanting. He is recounting all of that for us to drive us, not under the sun, but over the sun, to find our satisfaction in the S-O-N sun. And if we were to restate the theme of Ecclesiastes here this morning, it is simply this. You cannot enjoy life until you choose to enjoy God. So we've learned about the futility of life merely lived from an under-the-sun perspective. We've learned about the fallenness of humanity. We've learned about the curse of God on the world, that God has bent the created order, and nobody can straighten it. He's bent it on purpose, and it's a gift from him that we would not go on trying to seek those things under the sun which can only be found in him. We've also learned about the sovereignty of God over all the details of life. We've learned as well that judgment is coming. And Solomon will expand that theme towards the end of his sermon. And we've learned that the gifts of God, gifts like eating and working and recreation, they are actually available to those who love God, to those who look up, even while they tread life under the sun. We understand that humanity lives in exile from the garden. We are sons of the man, sons of the Adam. Uh, that is a, a reference over and over again in this book to our hereditary nature that comes from our first parents. We are victims of the fall and we are perpetrators of our own fallenness. We are sinners walking amongst other sinners on a God-cursed earth, frustrated by the brokenness around us and the brokenness within us. And yet we are blessed by undeserved kindness from our Creator, who showers us with unmerited and unappreciated gifts every day. And for the mass of humanity that has not yet learned to look up beyond the sun, 
those gifts from God become a further cause for frustration because they in themselves do not yield the satisfaction that humanity seeks to wring from them. But for those who by God's grace have already arrived at Solomon's conclusion, who have already entered into relationship with their maker, those temporal gifts like marriage or a career or a vacation or a good meal or a good friend, those gifts from God actually become a source of great joy for they yield the sweet foretaste of God's goodness to be dispensed for those whom he loves for all of eternity. That is where we are in the book of Ecclesiastes. That is what we've learned so far. And now Solomon is going to give us some areas of life in which to use wisdom to navigate this life, given its fallenness, given its nature as bent or cursed by God for his purposes, living under the sovereignty of God, enjoying his gifts, seeking a right relationship with him through faith. There are four areas of life we'll look at this morning that require wisdom if we are to mitigate some of the frustration of living in a fallen and cursed world. That's what this morning's message is all about. That's what Ecclesiastes chapter 4 is about. If we want to go about mitigating some of the frustration of the fall, some of the frustration of living in this world, there are areas of life requiring wisdom. We'll look at four areas this morning. Sin, work, friendship, and popularity. Let's look at sin first. We're going to look, number one, at the evils of human oppression. And here Solomon in verses 1 to 3 gives us a glimpse of the evils of humanity at its worst. He says, Then I looked again at all the acts of oppression which were being done under the sun. And behold, I saw the tears of the oppressed, and that they had no one to comfort them. And on the side of their oppressors was power, but they had no one to comfort them. Solomon talks about all the acts of oppression. Literally, he says, I saw all the oppressions. And what he means here is all forms of oppression, all kinds of oppression. This word for oppressions in the Old Testament is used to describe any number of wrongdoings of humanity against humanity, cheating one's neighbor, defrauding, robbing, making unjust gains, usurious interest, the abuse of power, especially against the vulnerable, poor, widows, orphans, strangers. It's often associated with bloodshed, violence, and the denial of justice. And Solomon laments this reality. He talks about the tears of the oppressed. There was none to comfort them. He says it twice in verse 1. It's almost like he can't get past the, the awfulness of seeing somebody cry, weep, and there's no comfort to be had. And he says, at the hands of the oppressors, power. Why should the mean people get to be in charge? You and I must come face to face with the reality that that ability, that corruption, is in every human heart. It's in you and it is in me, just as much as it was in any tyrant you could think of in world history. You know, the world's aphorism is this, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Uh, The world is on to something, but... They have the foundation wrong. You see, God's assessment is that every man is corrupt from birth. And power gives opportunity for that corruption to spill out into the lives of others. And the greater the power given to any individual person, the greater the opportunity for those corruptions of the human heart to adversely affect more people, sometimes many more people. Add to that the increased temptation that comes with power and position. You become accustomed to getting what you want when you want it, no matter the cost to others. This this is completely opposite of Jesus' leadership principles. Jesus' thoughts on leadership were revolutionary in a world built on power and position and oppression. They were counterintuitive against the grain of our natural inclinations. Jesus said, you want to be the first? Be the least. 
You want to be the greatest? Be the servant of all. You wrap a towel around your waist and you do the most menial chores. You wash the feet of those whom you lead. And we didn't learn Jesus' lessons on the playground. And from the playground to Pol Pot, to Hitler and Hirohito's murderous stranglehold of most of the world in World War II, to Idi Amin in Uganda or Joseph Stalin in Russia, to Kim Jong-un in North Korea today, to the man-stealers in Africa and the European slave traders and the holders of slaves in the American South, to apartheid in South Africa. The list is really unending when we think about the manners of oppressions that have affected people throughout human history. Solomon's proverb here in verse 2 is a a better than proverb. You'll see these a lot through the book of Proverbs and in the book of Ecclesiastes. One thing is better than another. It's a way to compare things, uh, to illustrate something by a, a comparison or a contrast to something else. Notice what Solomon compares in verse 2. So I congratulated the dead who are already dead more than the living who are still living. And better off than both of them is the one who has never existed, who has never seen the evil activity that is done under the sun. Solomon is highlighting the awful nature of human oppression by saying it's better not to be alive on this earth and see it than to experience it any longer. And if you and I limit our perspective to a view from this life only, it would be better not to live than to see or to experience the various kinds of oppression that humans are subjected to in this life. One Bible scholar said it this way, So long as the central point of man's existence lies in the present life, and as long as this life is not viewed as the forecourt of eternity, there is no enduring consolation to lift us above the miseries of this present world. You see, Solomon contends here that the good things, enjoyable things that you might enjoy in this life are not worth the pain of the suffering under the oppression of man's inhumanity to man. We really should say man's humanity towards man. And for those of us who have been reared in the second half of the 20th century in America, a remarkable season of relative peace and societal stability it's probably hard for us to grapple with Solomon's words here. You mean, death is better than life? I thought life was good. You know, we have a a clothing brand called Life is Good. They sell t-shirts and coffee mugs and jewelry and spare tire covers and dog food bowls and Frisbees. All with this logo emblazoned on them, Life is Good. That is ignorant. Blind, suicidal optimism. What what an ignorant message that is. It's almost infuriating. It ignores the only source of good, God alone. It presumes the inherent goodness of man, and it demands that we all turn a blind eye to the tears of those who are oppressed by the depravity of their fellow humans. Life is good is an awful statement in the context in which it is preached to our culture. Listen, nobody who lived in Poland during the 20th century was out in the park throwing around a life is good frisbee. Ask anybody who lived there or any Eastern European country in the last century. They were run over in two consecutive world wars, oppressed by Nazi Germany and then communist Russia. During World War II, if Nazi warlord Adolf Hitler wanted petroleum to fuel his tanks so that he could overrun one more Eastern European country... He would just order his army, you know, fathers, sons, brothers, husbands. He he would just order them to shed their blood to acquire someone else's land. And then Hitler would send in slave labor comprised of the undesirables in Europe. Anyone who is not considered pure Nordic race, the Jews, the Poles, Slavic peoples. And he would send them into the coal mines, the oil fields, the refineries to work as slave labor until they died. They were intentionally underfed. Sometimes they were sterilized so they couldn't reproduce. They were replaced by new slave labor whenever they died on the job or were shot. Whole towns under the Third Reich were simply wiped off the map. 
And records of who they were and where they lived and what they did are completely gone. I have an excerpt here this morning from the Nuremberg Trials. From an eyewitness to the liquidation of one small town in Ukraine. He says, my foreman and I went directly to the pits. I heard rifle shots in quick succession from behind one of the earth mounds. The people who had got off the trucks, men, women, and children of all ages, had to undress upon the order of an SS man who carried a writing or a dog whip. They had to put down their clothes in fixed places, sorted according to shoes, top clothing, and underclothing. I saw a heap of shoes, about 800 to 1,000 pairs, great piles of underlinen and clothing. Without screaming or weeping, these people undressed, stood around in family groups, kissed each other, said farewell, waited for a sign from another SS man who stood near the pit, also with a whip in his hand. During the 15 minutes that I stood near the pit, I heard no complaint or plea for mercy. An old woman with snow-white hair was holding a one-year-old child in her arms and singing to it and tickling it. The child was cooing with delight. The parents were looking on with tears in their eyes. The father was holding the hand of a boy about 10 years old and speaking to him softly. The boy was fighting his tears. The father pointed to the sky, stroked his head, and seemed to explain something to him. At that moment, the SS man at the pit shouted something to his comrade. The latter counted off about 20 persons and instructed them to go behind the earth mound. I well remember a girl, slim and with black hair, who as she passed close to me, pointed to herself and said, 23 years old. I walked around the mound and found myself confronted by a tremendous grave. People were closely wedged together and lying on top of each other so that only their heads were visible. Nearly all had blood running over their shoulders from their heads. Some of the people were still moving. Some were lifting their arms and turning their heads to show that they were still alive. The pit was already two-thirds full. I estimated that it contained about a thousand people. I looked for the man who did the shooting. He was an SS man who sat at the edge of the narrow end of the pit, his feet dangling into the pit. He had a Tommy gun on his knees and was smoking a cigarette. I can't read the rest. Maybe there have been times where you felt it would be better to be dead. Better never to have been born than to come into this world. Maybe you've echoed what Paul said in Philippians 1. If I'm to live on in the flesh, it means fruitful labor. But I'm hard pressed and I have the desire to depart and be with Christ. The oppression that God hates is not just that of dictators, warlords, and tyrants. Power in the hands of the few employed to keep the masses under their thumbs. The populations of normal folks breaking their backs to supply the whims of the privileged powerful. There are lots of kinds of oppression. And the seeds of it are in every one of our hearts here this morning. I think about spiritual authority. You know the story of the widow putting in her last two coins into the temple treasury that funded all the hypocrisy and wickedness of the so-called religious leaders. I think about TV preachers bilking dollars from the naive poor for the funding of their earthly empires, for their fleets of airplanes. I think about those in spiritual authority who lord authority over the people for love of power, or self-preservation, or personal prestige. You can read Ezekiel 34, where God condemns the bad shepherds of Israel, whose task was to feed the sheep, and he says, you're eating the sheep, and fleecing them for your own profits. I think one of the greatest tragedies is to see a professing Christian as a husband use his authority and position his responsibility to wield power over his wife or his children in an ungodly way, where he sees his marriage as his golden opportunity to have someone else fulfill his personal preferences. You might be thinking about the human trafficking industry, 
child abuse, or terrorism, the oppression of babies in the womb, without even a mother to cry out on their behalf. And that's the end of Solomon's proverb about oppression. What kind of wisdom is this? I mean, Solomon, aren't you going to give us some instructions about how to fight oppression or how much God hates oppression or what we should do about it? And yes, Solomon does that in other places. I actually have a list here in my notes. I'm going to skip them this morning. If we had time, we would go through those. Old Testament, New Testament tells us that God hates oppression. He condemns this kind of sin. And he urges those who know about it to fight against it in the realms in which they can. And that's appropriate and biblical. Solomon doesn't go there here in this text. The point of this text in this sermon of Solomon's, is to drive us to despair. And wisdom here recognizes the realities and the awful evils of human oppression. And it's part of Solomon's tactics to get us to not just live for life under the sun, but even to despair of it and to look up. There is a judgment coming, an assessment by God Fixing oppression is not Solomon's primary goal here in Ecclesiastes 4. But he is driving us to the one who will absolutely right every wrong. And for those who belong to him, he will dry every tear and comfort every sorrow. You must know that every oppressed person and every oppressor will stand at the bar of God's judgment at the end of time. Solomon gives us another area If we're to navigate life in a fallen and cursed world, beyond the evils of human oppression, there's a second area we must look at for wisdom this morning, and it is work. We could call it the vexations of imbalanced labor. Solomon says in verse 4, I have seen that every labor and every skill which is done is the result of rivalry between a man and his neighbor. This too is vanity and striving after wind. In verses 4 through 8, Solomon's going to give us several different angles on your job, on work, on toil, on labor. And the first one is all about envy. In verse 4, Solomon is describing the covetousness in the human heart, which is the driving force of much human industry. He describes here the rat race runner who is driven by the engine of envy. And this man that Solomon describes here, or this phenomenon, is is not someone who's intent on building a better mousetrap, but a man who is intent on destroying all other mousetraps in his way so that his mousetrap can be the only mousetrap. He, He wants what another man has, whether he earns it or not. He is driven by greed and idolatry and covetousness. His life at the heart level is a violation of God's law. I want what others have. And the tools at his disposal are bribery, stealing ideas, false advertising, building a monopoly in a market, cronyism, you know, getting cozy with government officials or the ones who make the rules so that you can get the government to legislate your competitors out of business. All of these evil, wicked schemes driven by a heart that thinks it can be satisfied by more stuff, more prestige, a higher rung on the company ladder, and it's rotten at the core. You need to know that production fueled by envy will never satisfy. Solomon's already taught us that because envy itself will never be satisfied. Envy, rather, needs to be killed. Listen, it's easy to blame the big, bad corporation for living this way. But you and I know this is inside every one of us. We think the grass is greener on the other side. We we think that our neighbor has something that we ought to have. We think we deserve better than we get. We, We have a high view of ourselves, a low view of God, a low view of others. We have misestimated our value and our worth and our merits. 
and we're driven by jealousy and envy and relationships and materialism and enterprise. And what does God say about this? Philippians 2, do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. That includes how you go to work. The second angle Solomon takes on work is laziness. It's in verse 5. The fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. What a fantastic proverb. The, the hands folded is a picture of, that's not what the hands are supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be using your hands to accomplish something. The lazy man folds his hands when he should be doing things. He is the rat race dropout. And what does Solomon say about the fool who folds his own hands? He consumes his own flesh. The result is self-cannibalism. Laziness here is condemned. And the New Testament speaks about this as well. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica, For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. We hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. Right? You can't be a mooch. That's just sin. Self-destructive. Harmful to others. There's another angle on work yet in verse 6. Solomon writes, One hand full of rest is better than two fists full of labor and striving after wind. Here he's addressing the workaholic. One hand full of rest, with the, the hand cupped receiving the good gift of God's rest. That's different than the lazy man whose hands are folded. This man's hand is cupped to receive God's gracious gift of rest in its time. And it's balanced with the other hand with productive labor. And the one hand full of rest is better than a two-fisted grip on materialism or advancement or pride and promotion. That two fists full of labor Solomon calls a striving after wind and a havel. Again, that vanity, that emptiness. You might get the promotion, the raise, the prestige, the new suit, the car, the yacht. If you've got both hands gripped on your work. But the weariness, the life crisis, the coronary, and the early grave are the results. Perhaps discontentment fuels the man with a two-fisted grip on his work. Maybe he's fueled by his belief in the lie that satisfaction is to be found just around the next corner, the next success, the next rung on the company ladder, the next achievement, or the next toy. And what does God say about all of this? I'll give you 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 to 11. Godliness Godliness, not a two-fisted grip on your nine-to-five, but godliness is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. We have brought nothing into the world. We can take nothing out of it either. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. The lazy fool is condemned. The workaholic is condemned. And the last angle Solomon gives here is the lonely miser. Verses 7 and 8. Then I looked again at a vanity under the sun. There was a certain man without a dependent, having neither a son nor a brother, yet there was no end to all his labor. Indeed, his eyes were not satisfied with riches, and he never asked, For whom am I laboring and depriving myself of pleasure? This too is vanity and a grievous task. The lonely miser has no no one to share all his labors with. He's only been working for himself. 
And while he thought that was the way to go, the working only for himself brought a level of disappointment even while he was working. And it brings a whole other level of disappointment when he gets to the end and realizes it was for nothing. The New American Standard inserts this little phrase, and he never asked. I don't think that should be there. I think the Hebrew as it stands is good. Indeed, his eyes were not satisfied with riches. For whom am I laboring and depriving myself of pleasure? I think what Solomon does here is he feels the plight of the lonely miser so strongly that he puts himself in the first person and asks the question for him. Why am I doing this? All the early mornings and late nights, all the sacrifices, I'd never had time for a family. I don't need anyone. Besides, then I'd have to share it with people. So I pursued the career, and, and now at the end, what did I do this for? And this makes that lonely miser doubt everything he's ever done, and apparently when it's too late. And Solomon says, this is Hevel, emptiness, vanity, futility, and he says, it is a grievous task. Literally, this is bad business. What a grievous disappointment. There was no satisfaction in the work itself. It was always elusive. He, he thought it would be around the next corner. Maybe he thought it would be when he retired. It robbed himself of the joys of companionship. And no one benefits. Not any kin and not himself, one commentator said. His kin was money. That's all he had. No return for his labor. That's a bad business indeed. Imbalance work is vexing. There's another area of life that Solomon wants us to explore this morning with wisdom to help us navigate life where we are. It is the benefits of timely companionship friendship. Look at verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. And Solomon starts in the business world. He says, in, in an enterprise, in, in a company, when two people work together, the, the, the sum is greater than its parts. This is why we have companies and firms and workplaces and co-workers and partnerships and teams. You know, if the present workforce in the world is three and a half billion people. Have you noticed we don't have three and a half billion lemonade stands <laughs> or individual enterprises? Why? Because more value is gained when people are able to work together to use their diversified gifts and abilities and desires to accomplish a goal. There's a benefit to timely compassion, uh, companionship in business. There's a benefit to timely companionship when you're in need of help. Look at verse 10. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. He just says, if they fall, if there's two, there's help. You may have heard about the rock climber out in the Utah wilderness all by himself who got his arm stuck in a rock ledge. You're wincing already because you remember the story. He needed help and he didn't have it. And he cut off his arm and walked out. If only there had been someone with him. And verse 11 is an example of warmth in the cold nights of a desert. You know, in Solomon's day, the, these three examples in verses 10, 11, and 12 probably all have something to do with traveling in the ancient Near East. Hot days, cold nights. A traveling companion was helpful. If two lie down together, they can keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Even survival was dependent on companionship. And then in verse 12, protection is in view. Solomon says, if one can overpower one who is alone, two can resist him, and a cord of three strands is not easily torn apart. There is protection. If highway bandits are going to come up against you as you're traveling by yourself, it's much easier for them to overpower one than it is to overpower two, or better yet, three. And certainly, this principle exists from the beginning. In Genesis 2.18, before the fall, God said it is not good for a man to be alone. 
You might be thinking in terms of marriage and the companionship that happens in marriage, but I don't think that's what Solomon has in view here. It's certainly one application. But when he goes from two to three, uh, it means that two is not the magic number for friendship. It is the magic number for marriage. Okay? It's not necessarily the magic number for business, companionship, for traveling, for protection. You and I understand the New Testament principle here, that we are members one of another. We have been placed by God, by the Holy Spirit, as interdependent parts in an organism called the body of Christ. And just like a physical body, the individual physiological parts of that body are interdependent on one another. You can't lop off a part of the body and the other part of the body said, I didn't need it. No, we were designed by God to be a body of interdependent members. There's no lone wolf Christianity. There's no uh, solo living the Christian life. We are designed to be interdependent. Romans 12, 5, we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Think about your relationships in a spiritual sense with others in the context of the local church. And, and I'll use Solomon's uh, same examples, business, help, warmth, and protection. Okay, this, this isn't what Solomon means by these things, but, but I want to move forward and think about how these apply even to us uh, in the context of the church. Think about the business of the church. The writer to Hebrews says this, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. It's pretty hard to stimulate one another to love and good deeds if you're all by yourself. <laughs> right? We need one another. And we need each other for help when we fall. If you're alone and you fall, are you going to get back up? There's a question. And the book of Hebrews warns believers about falling away and encourages believers to help one another in that. Paul says in Galatians 6, Brethren, if anyone is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens. We need each other when we fall. We need help. And we need each other for the warmth of encouragement, of fellowship, of truth, of singing songs to one another, of prayer. And we certainly need protection. An isolated Christian is easy pickings for the temptations of this world, the pressures of this life, and the fiery darts of the enemy of our souls. Peter tells us that be of sober spirit and be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. We need each other. I hope you treasure and value the benefits of timely companionship. Solomon recognized that in his day. There's a fourth area that we need to navigate wisely. We could call it popularity or fame, or position. Solomon wants us to know about the emptiness of power and popularity. This is verses 13 to 16. And here Solomon gives the tale of three kings. He says, A poor yet wise lad is better than an old and foolish king who no longer knows how to receive instruction. For he has come out of prison to become king, even though he was born poor in his kingdom. I have seen all the living under the sun throng to the side of the second lad who replaces him. There is no end to all the people, to all who are before them, and even the ones who will come after later will not be happy with him, for this too is vanity and striving after the wind. I'm convinced that Solomon, when he wrote this, had just got done reading Edward Gibbons' The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which is 6,000 pages of that story. Over and over and over and over and over again. One king rises, and he has his heyday, and his poll numbers decline. And another king comes, and humanity puts their hope in that king. Maybe it'll be better. And his poll numbers are great, and then they decline. And then another king comes, and he's better than all the rest. And this happens not only in dictatorships and kingdoms. We understand this in the context of election cycles, the first king in this story is old and unteachable. Probably wasn't always old and unteachable, if I had to guess. Now, there's probably a lesson in there in being teachable. 
Normally, the wisdom literature associates wisdom with the aged. Here, there's a reversal. It's almost like that you can't teach old dog new tricks. King number two comes along. He's young and poor, but he's wise. His is a rags to riches story. He's the common man's hero. He was born poor in the kingdom. He was even imprisoned, and his is the improbable rise of an unlikely hero. Everybody champions the underdog. And what happens to the underdog when he's the, I don't know, overdog, the top dog? Nobody likes them anymore. Pick another underdog. That's what happens to this second king. King three comes along. He's called a second lad. His popularity eclipses the beloved hero, the first lad, and then his poll numbers collapse too. There's nothing new. It's an endless cycle. The man hoisted to the platform of positive popular opinion gets what everybody wants. I mean, who doesn't want to be liked by everybody? And as one writer said, he has reached a pinnacle of human glory only to be stranded there. It is yet another of our human anticlimaxes and ultimately empty achievements. Think about reputation, legacy, fame, popularity. Solomon says it is fleeting. He concludes the section, it is a vanity and striving after wind. Go ahead, try to catch the wind. As soon as you catch it, it's not blowing anymore. It's a fruitless exercise. You can spend your whole life chasing the reputation you have in the eyes of others. And Solomon says, it is Hevel. Think about the nature of power and politics. And, I mean, if everybody wants to be king, then everybody's gunning for you. It's not a safe place to be. Think about the nature of crowds. Crowds are so fickle. You remember that Palm Sunday and Good Friday were about five days apart. The king of kings, creator of the universe in the flesh, marches into Jerusalem, his city, his rightful place, the throne of David, his people, his earth. And the people cry out, Hosanna, save us. We're so glad you're here. Palm branches, coats, honor, acclaim. Five days later, what are they crying out? Crucify him. I hope you're not tricked by the deception of the allure of popularity. There's nothing new under the sun. Human populations like clockwork long for changes in the way that they're governed. Maybe the next king will be better. People champion political revolutions or long for the next election. Yeah, I think humanity puts its hope so often in human government even though it never works out. Because human government is this non-personal thing out there that gets to take the blame when things go wrong. I can sort of displace the blame from the condition of my own heart and put it up there on the big, bad, faceless government. Governments can be blamed. Governments can be replaced. Replacement governments can be blamed and replaced. <laughs> and the problem is me. The problem is humanity at the heart level. Humanity's fundamental problem cannot be solved by humanity. Do you understand that? If we think a sinful human being can bring solutions to the fundamental problems of sinful human beings, we've misunderstood everything. If you seek to ignore the problem in your heart, you will never find the solution to the problems of the world around you. It's like closing your eyes and wearing a blindfold and then covering your head with blankets and then complaining about the people who didn't turn on the lights. Oh, you say you did turn on the lights? Well, you didn't put enough lights in here. Oh, it's filled with lights? Well, somebody's at fault I can't see. The problem is me the whole time. And the amazing thing is that God has provided a solution to our slavery to insanity. A solution to the fundamental problem of our blindness. And a rescue from this broken and cursed world. 
you understand that God's solution is not of this world. God himself had to come from outside of this world, and, and he did that in the person of Jesus Christ. And he dwelt in this world. And he suffered at the hands of corrupt humanity. He suffered under the curse of his own design. Jesus knew what it was to weep at the tomb of Lazarus, who, by the way, was a sinner and a friend. Jesus knew what it was to feel weakness and pain. And worst of all, best of all, worst of all, best of all, Jesus knew what it was to endure the Father's wrath against every sin of everyone who would ever believe past, present, and future. To win for himself a humanity redeemed from a fallen world, redeemed from their own corruptions, redeemed from the curse of God, and redeemed from the consequences of their own sins. Listen, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, God's provision of forgiveness, if you do that this day, once and for all, you will have a clean slate before God. Not only will God declare you never to have done anything wrong, but he will have declared you always to have done everything right and thereby, by the merits of Jesus Christ, to be fit for heaven. To be in a place where there is no more weeping, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. Revelation 21.4, where the curse is gone. That belonged to the first things. And Christian, that's where you and I belong. A new heavens and a new earth. I pray that Solomon's sermon drives unbelievers to despair of life under the sun, but believer, let it drive you to long for the return of your king, for the final freedom of the glory of the children of God when all of creation will be set free from its slavery to corruption, when we get to have God, to see him face to face, that he would be our treasure, for he comes through on what he promises. And what he says at my right hand are pleasures forevermore. He makes good on that promise. And he satisfies what our hearts were built for, a relationship to him. Let's pray. Oh God, this morning, would you be pleased? Would you be pleased to rescue anyone that's here this morning who is still a subject to the slavery of the corruption of this world? For anyone who is still enamored with what the world has to offer who still believes the lie that something in this world, something just around the corner can satisfy. God, would you bring that vapid dream to an end? Would you awaken, bring to life? God, I pray for all of us that we would love you more than the good gifts that you give that we would appreciate the good gifts that you give. And that while you leave us here on this earth, we would be faithful ambassadors of you, our King, and faithful ambassadors of the realm to which we belong. For your glory, in Jesus' name.